Hello, I'm Sarah Jennings with Frontier Development Lab, and welcome to our SETI Live. The Frontier Development Lab is an applied AI research accelerator, and we bring together PhDs and postdocs from machine learning and pair them with space scientists and domain experts to work on challenges in space science and exploration. So today I am here with the digital twin of the COAST team. Uh, this is in partnership with USGS, uh, MIT Portugal, NASA, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and Google Cloud. Today I am here with Helga, Nis, Constantine, and Peshi. Uh, so really excited to have you guys here. Uh, to kick us off, I would love if you could tell me a little bit about the challenge that you're working on and why it's important. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Constantine. Yes, so um, firstly, thanks for having us um, on this Facebook Live session, Sarah. It's um, great to be able to talk about something that we've been excited about and have been working on for the past month. And we think this project matters, and so we want to share why we think it does matter. So sadly, um, we have to look no further than the disaster that is going on in Europe right now um, to get a motivation uh, for our work. So Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg, and Netherlands are experiencing flooding uh, caused by rainfall that has not been seen in over 100 years right now. Um, and something like 40 people are dead and many are missing. Situations like this remind us of uh, just the destructive power that nature has um, and flooding has in particular, and that we can't always control nature, but we have to prepare to adapt to its fluctuations. And so this FDL challenge is about flooding, but with a specific focus on coastal flooding. So New York, Singapore, Miami, half of the global population lives um, within 100 kilometers or 60 miles from the ocean. And hurricanes and storms can do a lot of damage. Annually, 1.5 million people are affected and 8,000 people die, um, making coastal flooding one of the biggest hazards of human society in the future. And this problem is worsened by climate change. Climate change makes glaciers melt, which in turn increases the sea level. With a higher sea level, flooding is more commonplace and destructive. So what can we do to prepare ourselves um, for coastal flooding? Right, so the first step is to know what's coming through good predictions of flood maps, which is what we're doing in our project. So here, the inputs are features such as pressure and wind fields. One approach is to encode all of this knowledge that we have of the earth science and the physics required to understand our problem, and we pack it into a physical model. And this is indeed a good strategy in this, what is applied in practice right now. However, it is very computationally expensive to do this, which means that sometimes the flooding can occur before the computer has really stopped running. So that's not something that um, we can deal with. And maybe by speeding up the computation in some way, we can um, also do a lot in order to understand uncertainties of these things. So in our project, we're proposing to create a new model based on machine learning. So we give a machine learning algorithms the inputs and the outputs of the physics model, and it let it learn the relationship in between. Um, and this is called the digital twin. And that is um, what our project is about and why we care. Great, thank you so much, Constantine, for that overview. And uh, I just wanted to do a shout out for some of our audience members that are joining. So it looks like we've got Georgia, Connecticut, and Fresno, Toronto. Uh, if you do have questions at any time, um, please share those with us and we'll have some time at the end to uh, do a little bit of Q&A with our researchers here. So Constantine, you mentioned um, digital twin. Can um, one of you describe what exactly a digital twin is? And is this like a new term? I can take it, yeah. Great. Hi, hi everyone, first of all. So what is a digital twin? Digital twin is a virtual representation of an object or a system created from uh, uh, real world data using simulation, machine learning. Uh, we can say in other words uh, that uh, it means creating a highly complex virtual model that is the exact counterpart or the twin of a physical thing. And this thing could be, for example, uh, cars or a building, 
but in our case, it's the dynamic of uh, coastal systems. And uh, we should uh, be seeing this digital twin as uh, vital tools to help us to understand not only how products or systems are performing at the moment, at the present, but how they will perform in the future by creating uh, real world scenarios uh, virtually. So for example, we can predict the impacts that a storm or certain of a certain magnitude or duration can have on land. And this information is important, of course, for governments to improve decision making and uh, planning. Thank you, Helga. And thanks for explaining what a digital twin is and how it's helping us uh, better understand our coast. Uh, so I know that you guys are using a couple of surrogate models, um, Cosmos and Nemo. Um, can someone on the team share a little bit about um, what those exactly are? Yeah, um, so the two Phoenix model we're going to um, build on is the Nemo and Cosmos. So both are Phoenix based models to simulate the coastal dynamics, but these two models are developed by two different agencies. For example, the Cosmos is developed by the United States um, Geological Survey. It's aimed at simulating the inhibition heights um, at a small area like the Los Angeles County, because the inhibition height is usually driven by a combination of forces such as the wind, um, um, and tides, and ocean wave. On the other hand, NEMO is used to simulate the sea surface heights as shown on the um, right, um, but at a very large area. For example, NEMO has been used to simulate the Northwest Europe. Um, so these sea surface heights are usually drawn by storm events. So um, for our case, uh, we are going to use simulation from both NEMO and Cosmos to build up our solar gas model. So there will be two, and eventually our Digital twin um, will contain two, di two different circuit so model to simulate the sea surface height at different spatial scales. So, constantly, if you, if you can click the animation on the right. Yeah. So, on the right is the animation of the Nemo simulation for one month. And as you can see, on the top is the wind speed at X and Y, and on the bottom is the mean sea, sea um, surface level pressure as well as the sea surface height. So the sea surface height is something we want to predict, and the other three are the driving forces. Clearly, from this animation, we can see a very strong correlation between the sea surface height and the other three forces. And these strong correlations actually provides us confidence to build a, to build a accurate but fast lightweight um, surrogate model for Nemo in this case. Thanks. Thanks, Peishi. Uh, so you touched on it a little bit in your original um, sharing of the challenge as well as what you just shared there, but can you reiterate for uh, the audience um, how, what you're doing differently and how this is different than the current state of the art? Yeah, maybe I can take the question. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nis. Um, and uh, to answer your question, it might help to once again summarize a few things that uh, Konstantin, Helga, and Peishi have already told you, and that is how hard the problem is that we try to tackle. Um, basically, we want to hook in into the simulation pipeline of NEMO or Cosmos and um, replace um, parts of the numerical simulation at each point in space and uh, potentially also in time. And to give you some numbers for NEMO, for example, we are currently working on, on images with roughly 500 times 200 grid points uh, corresponding to 100K pixels at each time step. And um, our goal is to model the temporal dynamic of each of these 100,000 pixels with a comparable accuracy as uh, the numerical simulations do, but orders of magnitudes faster. So this is novel and wasn't done before. Um, and uh, the this, this speed up is really one of the main selling points of our model. Um, uh, being, uh, let's say, 100 times faster means uh, that the very same computers can estimate an entire ensemble of different outcomes where previously only a single result could be produced in the same time. And uh, we think that this will be incredibly helpful in reasoning about the likelihood of possible disasters. Um, and of course, also gives researchers more time to think about science rather than how to optimize the numerical procedure. And on the other side, um, we hope that our model will disentangle the dynamics driven by physical laws 
from the location specific effects. And this would mean that it might be possible to use a trained model, maybe with a few extra data points in locations where no numerical simulations exists yet. For instance, due to financial reasons. And coming back now back to your question, the current state of the art is driven by shallow neural networks, which predict based on conflating statistics, such as average wind speed, which is just a single value, rather than the wind speed at 100,000 positions, as in our case. And uh, these, model, uh, these models then predict a handful of low dimensional statistics, such, that, um, uh, such as um, the, um, the overall probability, for example, of a freak wave. To be clear, these models are already very helpful, but they are, in comparison in our model, extremely shallow with only a few, let's say, 100 parameters, and thus are also limited in their predictive power. Our models have roughly as many parameters as input features, so something out of magnitude of 100,000. Um, and so um, they can uh, they can deal, uh, they, they have to have these many parameters to deal with the high dimensional, but also highly correlated and convoluted data to make predictions with the very same resolutions as the input. Thank you, Ness, for that clarification. That really helps. Um, so you guys shared a little bit about the, um, the data. I was wondering if you could um, kind of show what that looks like and maybe um, share a little bit of details about it. Teishi? Oh yeah, so um, actually this is the ad, um, the animation I just showed, just the same thing that Constant if you can click that video again. So since we are replaying this animation, I just want to an answer one of the questions from the channel that the question is uh, whether the sea level will, will only rise or will it drop. So if you looking at the um, sea surface height on the uh, right bottom there, Actually, um, you can see the red and blue there, right? So the red indicates the increase of the sea surface height, and the blue indicates the decrease of the sea surface height. So definitely, it will increase and or decrease um, um, based on the local atmospheric environment. For example, if you look at the comparison between the sea um, um, surface level pressure and the sea surface height, whenever there's a strong or higher pressure there, it will press the sea goes down. And so it will show the blue area, which is the negative of the sea surface height. On the other hand, when whenever there's a um, lower pressure there and a strong wind there, basically it will push the sea um, surface increase. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Peishi. And thanks for answering one of our audience questions. That was um, perfectly timed with those wonderful visuals. So uh, now uh, I'd like to um, ask it, you guys have been working for about four weeks now. FDL is an eight week program. Uh, so it's a really intensive uh, eight weeks, um, but I'm told that you guys have some initial results and I was wondering if you would be willing to share those with us. Sorry, I had some uh, technical difficulties here. Do you see, oh, you see the wrong slide. So we do have some, we do have some first results, which we're very excited about. Um, this, um, it's very fast moving. Um, and so given that we only had one month, um, our findings aren't perfect yet, um, but we just managed to get some results that we literally finalized a couple of minutes uh, before um, coming in uh, to chat with you. But so here we're looking at NEMO data. And so this is what you just saw, but Pishi described really nicely with um, the sea surface height here being higher in red and, and lower in blue. And this on the right here is um, a UNET, which is um, a more traditional approach to, to your neural networks that comes from English segmentation and does not need very much data. Um, so we have some kind of first results with that. And um, on the, on, in the middle here, you see a Fourier neural operator. So this is a um, more new approach to, to how to deal with this. And um, we've actually coded this up from scratch because um, we want quite happy with the original implementation. And 
you see that firstly, we do see some kind of correlation. Obviously, this is not perfect yet, um, but this is why we're going to be working on this challenge for a little bit longer. But we see that we can already approximate sea surface height a little bit uh, with our first FNO approach. Great. Thank you so much, Constantine, for showing us a little um, bit of the initial results. I look forward to what you guys can accomplish in the additional four weeks that you have. Uh, so before we um, move on to the audience questions, I have a couple uh, more for you. Uh, I would really like to know from each of you why you are personally interested um, in this challenge. Um, so I don't know who would like to kick us off here. Um. Yeah, go ahead, Peshi. Okay, so uh, so I'm actually work, currently I work as postdoc at Pacific Northwest National Lab. So my background is hydrology. Uh, so the current coastal project is highly re re uh, related with one of our DOE Department of Energy project on the coastal dynamics. So um, another reason I joined this project is because of my personal interest in AI. Great. Thank you, Peishi. Yeah, it, it definitely get to dive into machine learning and AI, uh, and we're supported by our awesome uh, partners like uh, Google Cloud. Um, so thank you for being with us. And then Helga. Yeah. So uh, uh, I, it's the same. I, of course, I like uh, uh, machine learning. Also, her science and the, this uh, project uh, has both but uh, mainly because uh, the program is very interesting because we are from different fields uh, of uh, S4 and uh, the, the challenge, uh, it's very, it's something that uh, has a direct impact on society. If we can achieve, I think that's uh, the, something that uh, uh, it's for me, it's the, what, uh, um, Amuse me more about the, this project. Yeah, thank you, Hoka. And Ness? Yeah, uh, so first of all, I think I, uh, the, the most interesting point is because I love challenging, pro challenging problems. And uh, in my let's say, previous life, I worked uh, with uh, data of a CERN experiment, my PhD there. And uh, there I learned, let's say, the art to massage data until they reveal their hidden secrets in a way. So. Uh, doing now the very same in a discipline where the results can directly help people is really thrilling for me. And of course, besides uh, being surrounded by extremely talented people is a fantastic experience, uh, experience and I really wish the program could last longer. Yeah, uh, eight weeks is definitely very short, but good news, we generally all hang out together uh, after and continue the work. So thanks, Ness. And Constantine. I kind of want to echo what people have said. So I actually came from particle physics too, just as Nice, and we worked on the same small or medium-sized CERN experiment with a thousand people on it. Um, so for me, it's just also fantastic to learn um, from the subject experts. There's a lot to learn in, in this sphere, um, but also applying AI to um, something else. And, and secondly, it's just the importance. Um, the reason why I picked this specific project, not something else, is because I thought this is the project where I personally could make the biggest impact on something that um, I think is going to um, improve humanity and, and really affect people's lives. So thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, thanks for being here. This is this is really great um, and really happy that all of you are working on such an important challenge. Um, so before we dive into the audience uh, questions, um, do you have any last thoughts for the audience? Yeah, sure. Um, so. Good. We are, we are all here in this together. So we're all learning from one another. And it can be, I, I know it can be a little bit intimidating to ask a question in this kind of setting. But um, we've been asking each other so many dumb questions because no one coming in knew everything about this whole project. So please don't be shy and just ask uh, whatever you feel like. So it might be personal. It might be um, to do with this, this challenge. Just ask ahead. That's an awesome invitation. So with that, we'll go ahead and move into our audience questions. Uh, so the first one um, is, uh, do you include the tectonic shifts or only melting uh, and the atmospheric 
uh, parameters. So I think I'll turn that over to Peishi. Okay, um, thanks for asking the question. Um, the answer, uh, if the answer is whether we cannot, the, uh, whether we can or cannot, the answer is we can, but currently we are not doing that because the thing that we are doing is we try to predict the sea surface height very short time period. The, the thing that I did not mention is that the temporal resolution of NEMO is actually five minutes and the temporal resolution of Cosmos is hourly. Given that short, um, short peak, peak, um, period of time, it's very hard to see how the dynamic is from a long temporal range, for example, than hundreds of years, uh, have the impact on that. This is the first thing. And the second thing is, if we really want to pre, um, like see the contribution of the snow melting and salt water into the sea surface height um, rise or, or drop, um, we need a kind of a relevant physics model to provide us simulation data. So that will be definitely a different project to do, which can perhaps maybe another FDL project in, in, in the next year. Thanks, Peishi. Thanks for that answer. Um, so it looks like we have a few other uh, questions in the chat. I also wanted to say welcome to our folks that are coming Colorado, that's the state I live in, uh, Romania, and uh, looks like we have Turtle Island. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, so it, this question, um, you guys might not fully know the answer to, but I'll kind of like broaden it a bit. Um, can AI predict how much flooding there will be year by year? Or can you guys talk maybe a little bit to like how um, we currently understand how much flooding we might get from year to year? I can, I can take it. Great. So uh, I think that uh, we cannot say that we can predict how much flooding there will be. But with this uh, digital uh, twin uh, model, we can simulate uh, storms. And uh, so we can uh, uh, predict the impact of uh, a storm in land. And uh, so um, I think uh, um, even if we cannot predict exactly, we can try to understand what, we, what could happen uh, in the future. Constantine, did you want to build that? Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great way of looking at it. So we can't predict exactly what's going to happen on that specific date. Um, but we don't necessarily need to be able to do that. I think um, understanding kind of a distribution and understanding um, what the likelihood is of a specific storm, and then given that storm, how much flooding there will be, will already tell us a lot. And this is also how this can be used, for example, in climate models. Because of climate model models, we have some kind of idea how much the sea level is going to rise. That can be used as input into this model in order to predict how bad a storm is going to be if the sea level will have risen. So storm is, so storm is worse. So overall, in summary, um, we can't predict exactly what's gonna happen on a certain date, but we can see kind of the range of possibilities. Great. Thank you so much, Constantine and Helga. Uh, so it looks like we also have a question about, um, will the uh, code be open source and will eventually be published? So generally, uh, so FDL is, a, um, we believe in open science. So we work towards um, being able to publish and share our work and we believe in reproducibility. It's just generally it takes a little bit of time after uh, FDL um, ends for all of that to happen. So stay tuned on um, that and being able to share uh, all of the work that the team is going to be doing over these eight weeks. Um, so I, th I think I'll ask um, one last question um, from each of you on the team. Uh, and I just want to know, you guys have been in the last four weeks, we had boot camp week. What's one of the most um, interesting things that you learned uh, during the course of the last uh, four or five weeks that we've been together? Um, I know that Constantine, you had mentioned that not everybody like knew all of the pieces and now you guys are like kind of having them all come together. So um, I'd love to hear something interesting that you guys learned. Um, I, I can start, um, I learned a lot, but what is the most interesting thing? <laughs> That's a very hard answer. Uh, but I can, I, I can answer what I have learned. I mean, definitely I learned a lot of tech, um, techniques like from the AI perspective, I used to use Carrots and I want to move to PyTorch. I think like 
this project is a very good way for me to be understanding and there's uh, um, experts on AI. And I benefit a lot to um, dive into either coding and the theory of the machine learning part. And the, the other thing I benefit a lot is uh, um, kind of um, we are from different either disciplinary um, backgrounds, like I'm from the earth science, and even help us from um, earth science, but we're from different perspective actually. And um, she's in the like uh, geochemistry, help um, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm from hydrology and constant needs of um, machine learning. So in, initially we had may have some may have might have some disagreement. Like I would like to pursue um I want to achieve like physics make sense and they want to make the machine learning work. But eventually it is kind of have um complementary role there, which I think is very helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Feishi. That's great to hear the interdisciplinarity and everybody bringing in all the different viewpoints and you guys um, working together. Uh, so Helga, I think you um, had something you wanted to share as well. Yes. Um, I also uh, learn a lot. I think uh, of uh, what uh, Fishi said, it's it's very true, uh, and it's very nice to to. I never work with so so motivate people. So we are all always uh, interesting. Uh, we have a lot of ideas. Uh, I think I never uh, hear so much idea every day. We have a new idea. And uh, uh, all the program, I think, is very well uh, organized. And uh, we also have other projects that uh, are uh, um, also in the, the FDL program. So I think I, I, I have just good things to, to say about it. Awesome. Thank you, Helga. And we're excited to share with our audience um, more of those uh, challenges at later uh, Facebook Live. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, Nis or Constantine? Yes. Sure, I, uh, I can go. So, uh, yeah, as I already said, I'm originally I'm a particle physicist. So this is something new for me, but this is uh, really, really super exciting. Uh, at some point, you will identify some some equations uh, that you have seen in other contexts before. But in general, uh, this uh, this idea of um, of modeling storm surge and so on, this is uh, super exciting for me. And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm coming from from the uh, data science uh, perspective uh, to the problem, but um, there's so much to learn and uh, really exciting. And it's um, that's the other thing. Uh, uh, it's really the experience to work in such an amazing group. This is uh, really just just awesome. And yeah. Thanks, Ness. And Constantine. It's hard to go last because everyone's already said. Uh talked about all of the good points. I've learned a lot of technical things that I don't want to dive into here. But I think one other thing that I've learned is that attitude matters. So um, being on a team like this, where everybody supports one another, and it's not necessarily about, this is my idea, and I need to defend my idea against your idea, but mostly like everyone is happy to be proven wrong. Um, everybody is happy to help each other out. And it's just very refreshing to be in a space where that is true. Uh, and I've never, I've not seen as nice a team like this um, uh, working on in one direction um, that I was a part of. Thanks, Constantine. I really love that about um, all of our FDLers and this group as well. So um, thank you all for taking time out of the um, busy eight weeks to be able to spend with our audience. Uh, this has been really great and I've certainly learned a lot and I hope that our audience has um, learned some new things as well. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and close our SETI Live for today, and we will be back soon with some other FDL teams so we can uh, learn a little bit more about their challenges as well. So thank you, Nis, Peshi, Helga, and Constantine. Thanks, everyone.